Hello everyone, this is Nikki Robertson and welcome to another episode of the reInvent podcast. My guest today is Mitzi Hollander who has pioneered neurofeedback in clinical practice in South Africa. This is a cutting edge technology gaining popularity the world over for its ability to help people recover from traumatic brain injury and trauma. I found this discussion particularly interesting for anyone having experienced head injury of any kind, as well as for anyone who's experienced acute or chronic trauma. Mitzi is a mine of information regarding ADHD in children, teenagers, and adults. We discuss scientifically validated therapies, including vagal nerve stimulus, breathing techniques, and TRE. This is one of the few scientifically quantifiable methods for testing exactly what's going on in the brain, rather than just guessing based on symptoms alone. I'm sure you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I met you years ago. Um, I can't even remember what prompted me to come through to a lab and find out. Curiosity. It must have been. It must have been. I've always been fascinated by how the brain works. Um, Not just the physical brain, but the the quantum brain. And um, my background being in P&I, I understand how irrevocable or inseparable the brain and body are connected. So I'm going to invite you to take us on a journey and explain your story or enlighten us on what prompted you to create possibly one of the most sophisticated brain labs in this country. First of all, thank you for having me. (laughs) Okay, um, my background, just to tell you about that a little bit, um, I did an honours degree in educational psychology at UJ University. So I'm registered with the Health Professions Council as a psychometrist, meaning I can test kids and um, I have remedial as a background as well. And then part of the journey um, landed up with a family member, which we can talk about, um, with a brain injury um, where the prognosis was very poor and a whole lot of things had to happen. But in the end, I did some neurophysiology and I'm now also registered as an EEG technician in South Africa um, with the Health Professions Council. So that's just the, the a bit of the academics. Um, but obviously, we all have a personal journey in terms of how we get to where we are. Okay, so... In doing educational the, the the psychometry in educational psychology, my question was always: so I'm testing these kids, um, I'm getting test scores, I'm getting into test scatter, and it does give us a lot of information. I still have a lot of respect for the, you know, the process. But in terms of how do I take my academical information, my assessment information, and make it extremely accessible and practical for parents to understand and then be very functional and integrative with the approach when you when you approach the problem. Um, and what I saw was that we were trained in a certain way. If you see this, that's the referral. If you see that, that's the referral. It's basically looking at the symptoms and then um, in the way that we look at the DSM-5, those are the symptoms, that's how you treat it. I just got to a point where it wasn't a very satisfactory process for me anymore. It's like, we're not truly solving this problem. Why are the parents coming back? It means that the problem is not being solved. And in the meantime, you're dealing with people's feelings. You're dealing with a person on the other side. Um, and you have these little souls that you're taking there and there and there. Lots of money, lots of emotional stress. And definitely there are a lot of kids who are being helped, but there's a percentage of those children that land up that were like, okay, we've done all of this. And I still get that every day in the practice. We've done all of this and this hasn't helped. And that just prompted me, I think that put that need in my heart to say, let's just go a little bit further and see, is there something else that we need to explore? I landed up doing my internship many moons ago um, in the 80s at Forest Down School for Cerebral Palsy Children, um, where we worked with attention deficit disorder, we worked with epilepsy and obviously brain injury, TBIs and so on. And I'd always wondered why I landed there, you know, that was part of my my little path that was being paved for me. Um, And then in 1995, my ex-husband had a very serious car accident. Um, he landed up in a coma, um, had to fight for his life several 
occasions which he can recall. Um, and you know, there I go with the trigger, sorry, <laughs> still emotional. And um, the prognosis after that time was very poor. So basically when I took him home, he was in a wheelchair, he was in nappies, he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he didn't know our names. My little girls were quite young. He called us all Apple, Apple and Apple because he couldn't remember our names. Um, and there I was, as somebody with very limited finances at that point of our lives, um, and I had to see what I could do. I was very fortunate, you know, you get these people that are placed in places. It was over December and there was a young Jewish doctor in ICU. He was actually a neurologist, but he was just helping out in the ICU. And he said to me, you have to know that the brain, that there's something like neuroplasticity. So at that point, that was still a very new kind of concept. And you mustn't accept what people tell you about him. You need to go and explore this further. Who was the doctor? I can't remember. remember, but thank you. You know, if he ever listens to any... I don't even think he can remember, but I thank him a lot for that. Um, it says, go and explore further and don't accept... Um, just that the prognosis is poor because the prognosis was very poor at that point. So when I got home, I think I, I went into a mad woman phase, you know, where you like, I have to solve this problem. We need to see what's happening with this man. Is there something else that we could do? So every time I speak with the medical doctor, he just says, well, up the tegretol. And I'm like, but he's not having seizures. He says, there may be seizures. I said, what are the chances, if you give me the statistics, what are the chances that there's going to be seizures? So a very small percentage. And I said, I'm not going to give him the medication then. And I'm not saying to people they have to do that. I'm, I'm talking about my own personal journey here. So I, I stopped the medication. Um, but looked at diet, looked at the food that I was giving him because I wanted to speak to people and say, so what's happened to his brain and what's happened to his body? You know, how do I go about it? With him being in the accident, everything shifted. So his whole metabolism was different. How do I treat that? You know, there was nothing out there. As that's what I said. I ran around like a mad woman trying to solve. And again, looking at the people on the side of mainstream medication that says, or medicine saying, why don't you try acupuncture? And why don't you do this? And let's look at this in this way. Realized at that point that oxygen movement was very important for his brain. Landed up at um, the Rappi Stadium in Pretoria where they had a hyperbaric oxygen treatment tank. When I spoke to the people at the hospital, and that was the last time I spoke with them, I said, I'm mad, there's no research. And I'm like, the brain needs oxygen. He cannot move. How do I get more oxygen to his brain? And I decided that I'm not going to consult with them again after that. If you look at where hyperbaric oxygen treatment is these days, yeah. it's it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. It's a total no-brainer that, you know, if you deal with a TBI, that would be one of the very first things that you're going to start considering in terms of just getting oxygen to the brain. And that's going to start healing. You know, that's how we're going to make new pathways to the brain. Um, and having a background in educational psychology, and remember, I'm, I'm a psychometrist, not an educational psychologist, but having had that background, and especially in remedial therapy, that really helped me in terms of the process. And that's, that started really shaping, shall I say, the conceptual framework within which I'm working. At Forest Down School, there was a, a neurologist. His name was Dr. David Saffer, and I think he may still be around. An amazing man. In my very first pre case presentation where we needed to discuss a child, for example, the child had a very low score on the block design test. He just kind of looked at me without any expression on his face. Remember, if you come out of varsity, you think you're going to conquer the world. With very dead eyes, he looks at me and says, so if the child has a low score on the block design test, what does it mean in terms of the brain? My jaw just dropped. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he just pointed out the biggest kind of vacuum in my training that I had. Right. We're working with a whole child, we're not working with symptoms. So in that way also, he just said, so next time when you come into the case conference, best you know a bit about the brain. Jeez, did I start? Oh, so it was, <gasps> but it it's like one of those 
turning points yes. in your life where you're like, okay, that was a slap, but did I wake up? Sure. You know, I could have been aggressive and resistant, mm -hmm. but I'm just like, okay, what is the best neurophysiology book that I can get? And I started looking at the brain. So from that very point where I then started doing assessments, I started saying, so if this is the block design test, where am I going to look for in the brain? Where's the function? And we also have to be careful when we talk about it because the brain is so complex and so layered that I can't say, oh, that's the spot for for 3D spatial orientation. But it helps to start unfolding the layers of the onion so that and we're never going to be done with it, not in my lifetime, you know, not in a next generation are we going to truly understand what the brain is about. So that was a huge wake-up call for me. Um, my husband now is a professor at the university and he challenged me a few years ago. He said to me, what is the conceptual framework of your practice? And I'm like looking at him saying, but I don't want to do a PhD actually. Um, <laughs> I'm not one of your PhD students. He says, so how, how do you know where you're going with this? He says, oh, I've got a vision and a mission and you know, I know where I'm going with this. He says, no, I need you to think about a conceptual framework. My daughter who's in marketing and she lives now in Singapore said the same thing. So mom, what, what is the conceptual framework? Uh, I had no idea. And then the, the thinking just started. So the whole idea was then, and what I, in hindsight, you know, hindsight is a perfect science. In hindsight, if I look back to the rehab of my ex-husband, I started at the bottom. I asked those questions then already of, this is his gut. He's, I'm struggling for him to go to the bathroom. He's so constipated. How do I get his bowel moving? You know, what do I do just to heal his gut? At that point, the whole gut-brain connection wasn't spoken of but, of, but intuitively, I just knew that I needed to look at that. Yeah. Okay, so that's a huge learning process for me. Um, so at the end of the day, when I look at a conceptual framework, it is an integrative framework. I can't work in my lab. I can have the fanciest QEG database. You know, BRC has got the biggest database in the world still. I can get all the statistics and be very scientifically based. But if I have an assumption that what that child is putting in his mouth has no impact on the brain, then I can't be in private practice. Okay, and at that point, that's where it started. So part of the conceptual framework is that we have to, when we start addressing a problem, and I'm talking about specific problems, you're gonna have psychological problems where your route is gonna be different. But for me, the type of clients that we work with, definitely I have to have a bottom-up approach. And if I have that bottom-up approach, and bottom starts at the bottom, literally. I have to go right down to the gut. So I have people like you that I have around me, people like the functional medicine doctors that I have around me, that when we start with a process, I know that that child is going to see somebody else before I can even contemplate doing neurofeedback on that child. Okay, so the gut and nutrition and wellness overall still remains the most important thing. That's the foundation, I think, what this is all about, okay? And that's the gut, I always say, that's really how, how low can you go, you know? <laughs> so we're starting with the bottom up. And when you start with a bottom up approach, and even if you look at uh, the triune brain, that McLean, I think that was in the 1960s, and it's an oversimplification of the brain. We said in the brain, we have the brain stem, and then we have the limbic system, and then we have the neocortex, and I'm saying to you, it's an oversimplification. But to start off a process to say that if the brain at least has those let's call it vertical layers, which is in true life isn't like that. There's no demarcation lines in the brain. It's much more complex. At least start off with a simplified way of trying to solve the problem. And remember, I'm talking about those children, the people that come into the practice, where that's the last resort. Unfortunately, we've done this, 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 this. Okay, we've decided to do a quantitative EEG. So it's the last resort. So the, 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 the population that I'm working with is already the people that didn't have success in, in, with mainstream approach. And I see that here as well. Yeah. <clears throat> we get the last resort. We are the last, last resort yes. when nothing else has worked. And yes. it's, it's a shame because 
it could be if if we address the basics so much quick Absolutely. more quickly you Absolutely. can heal so much more quickly yeah. i had a quick chat with my daughter this morning and she says imagine the trauma and the anxiety that parents need to go through with nothing being successful yeah. you know i'm a mom as well and i'm a grad so if somebody comes to you and says there's something wrong here the very first thing you ask yourself is what did i do wrong that's a mom response. It's like, oh my word, what are we doing wrong? What can you? And it's not what you're doing wrong. It's that you don't know about where you're going with something. Sometimes I always love. I say that baby's never born with a manual. The placenta is done. There's nothing like a manual in the placenta. So you don't have a manual that can say, oh, this is the civil one. This is his genetical predisposition. These are the gene mutations. Okay, off you go. Now you know exactly what to do. It's trial and error. And I'm talking about the population where we have challenges with the children. So that conceptual framework is part of, again, a no-brainer where we start bottom up. And, and that's what I did with my ex. Intuitively, in hindsight, what I did with him. So I knew from the beginning, and I just said that I have to treat him as if his brain, if he's just been born, and his brain is like a baby's brain, he's going to have to look at all the basic reflexes that need to be integrated after birth, um, how is his movement, is he starting to crawl, is he sitting, I literally worked it out in my mind that oh maybe he's already ready now to go to nursery school, you know, once we had the language going and everything again. so. It was a very, it's almost like a chronological development that had to take place to get functions ready. I would, for example, a very good example is, I would say, okay, the, this is our names. This is my name. These are the little girl's names. Okay, let's practice it. So we do, we think uh, with memory, if we repeat and repeat and repeat. But if there's such chaos in the brain, that information coming in, and we see this with the children with learning disabilities, you know, we think at the end they've got a working memory problem, but on a receptive level, yeah. that information isn't coming in. So when we look at research with ERPs, event-related potentials, where we give the brain a stimulus, and then they we can measure at 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 milliseconds, what does the brain do with that information? On a receptive level, there are, there's so much chaos, chaos and disorganization, that you're thinking that you're telling them and they're going to remember, but they can't remember the chaos. They, now, trauma. Yes, is exactly. That exactly. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, trauma is something that in this country, and I suppose in many countries, we it's, it's at levels that are out of control. Mm. And the brain cannot sort, remember, or anything while in a state of trauma. Mm. You know, and I'm sure you see this. You know, Absolutely. Children who, who have been yeah. traumatized, who've experienced mm. violence, who come from homes where there's chaos, mm. as well as having another layer of some kind of learning disability mm. on top of that. What is your approach? Oh, that's part of my bottom-up approach. So if we look at the brain stem. Um, and in simple language again, okay, it's far more complex. Um, the brain stem is almost like the boss of the autonomic nervous system. That's where the autonomic nervous system is registered. But the boss of the autonomic nervous system is the vagus nerve. And there we go right back to Stephen Porch's fantastic work that he's doing on the polyvagal theory. If you have at a very basic level, which we then register in terms of ERPs, the first 100 milliseconds is subconscious, brainstem is subconscious, but already then information, you need to start making yourself ready for the information coming in. So you're either going to be totally shut down, which is the freeze that Stephen Porteous refers to, or fawn, which is like I'm just pretending that I'm okay. Um, so you're going to either be there or you're in fight and flight. Now... You're going to be either, either be over alert, meaning in an anticipatory mode to anything that's happening, like a soldier in a war situation, or you're just going to be in freeze. So when that information is coming in, it's actually not registering at the level where it's supposed to be registered. There's nothing to receive it. There's, there's nothing to receive it. I'm busy doing a fantastic webinar with one of my, she's like my hero, her name is Seben Fisher. And she's always been my mentor in the field of neurofeedback. And um, she's doing a webinar at the moment. I'm right in the middle of this webinar now where she's talking about trauma. 
Um, she's talking about developmental trauma. She works very closely with Dr. Basil van der Kolk. He just recently wrote, not recently, a few years ago, he wrote that book, The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. And she also works with Dr. Ruth Lanius. A psych they're both psychiatrists and they're working on trauma specifically. And she discussed the other night, um, when we were exactly Sunday evening at 11 o'clock, I was doing this webinar. Um, she discussed exactly this ERP thing with people that's in trauma. And she was specifically referring to people with DID, um, dissociative identity disorder. And she hypothesized and said that when that information is coming through, and she showed us the ERP, she said, the chaos even at 100 milliseconds, is so much that that ERP graph just looks very different. And that they found in research, okay? So we often think that people, for example, if there was a childhood rape, you know, abuse or whatever, she hypothesizes that and says that it's not a suppression of a memory, it's chaos. The memory isn't there yet. So it's not that you have to go and take out the memory. You need to organize the psyche of this person, which obviously we do with neurofeedback as well. But then only can you almost formalize, you can make that memory more formal and then one can, and I hope I'm quoting her correctly because this, there's no research specifically on the memory. We're busy looking at the types of memories, declarative, you know, episodical, procedural memory, um, that kind of a thing. And where does it fit in into the brain and how then does it impact, you know, when you can't recall that traumatic incident that was there. So that chaos that's there when this incidence, when this sexual abuse is happening, doesn't allow that person to formalize, in my view and in her view, to truly... So you experiencing it, the trauma at a very visceral level, on your body level, a very basic brainstem level. Right. And I always say to parents that that brainstem is that primitive brain. You know, that's not my word. And it's like a crocodile. On top of that, we have the limbic system, which is the emotional system. On top of that, I have the neocortex. That crocodile does not take in words and it doesn't take in the emotions, you know, or, or responds to it. Um, and therefore, you have to look at other ways, you know, of saying, so how do we address the trauma? So she is amazing in working with the very severe traumas with neurofeedback for example and as I said she's written a book and she's just a pioneer in the field of, of developmental trauma. Um, if we work with them in South Africa yes we use neurofeedback as an option but definitely in terms of our approach we need to go and see so how do I regulate the vagus nerve? They're basic things that we can do if we have a specific breathing technique you know, you so what it's all about is this is my body. So we have an awareness that we, we help to create that awareness of children. So this is my body. How do I breathe? If I put the electrodes on your brain and you breathe rhythmically, you can see, wow, my high beta, my anxiety waves are coming down. It's an extremely empowering process when that child realizes, yeah, and then you have to create the awareness. So how are you feeling inside your body? <gasps> Oh, I don't have a stomach ache at the moment. Or, oh, yeah, my headache is gone now, you know. So um, definitely that awareness of the body. And then, obviously, you know, there's such amazing techniques. There's somatic experiences and EMDR and tapping and TRE that are all modalities where we go more into the, the body arena and saying, let's work with things there at a very basic level sorted out there but this is also where diet comes in you know this is also where if i know that i have an adrenaline adrenal gland that's just pumping adrenaline and i'm flooded with adrenaline and i have high cortisol levels i need to address that you know that's why i'm saying to you the bigger picture in terms of the the, the chemical natural environment of what's happening in the body um the analogy that i i, I always do with my clients is if the, the pH balance of the pool isn't good, if the pool isn't blue, I can take any kind of fancy tablet. I can even use neurofeedback as a fancy tablet. I do the tomati therapy. You know, I do a whole lot of other therapies. I do TRE. But if I don't get the pH balance, in inverted commas, 
of the body and the brain more online, I'm going to keep on putting in fancy blue tablets, but after the weekend when the guests have gone home, my pool is going to turn back, back green again. And those are the parents coming back to the practice saying, we've done this, we've done this, we've so many medications, up the dosage, stopped the, the medication, did this, this didn't work, where are we? And it's really stepping back. So it's an integrative, holistic approach working in with, within a very definite conceptual framework. So that was my journey with my ex as well, saying, okay, let's get him to sit up straight. Let's teach bladder control. You know, I can't, be six foot six. I can't change his nappies all the time. I had a wonderful neighbor across the road and she was a physio. She came in three times a day to help me with him, just to get the movement going. Yeah. Um, and I must say the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, I'm a big fan. Yes. A big fan. And in that process, one night, evening, very very late, I opened up the Star. Then we still bought newspapers. Yeah. I opened up the Star newspaper in the Verve section, and there was an entire page on neurofeedback. But you know when your body just get, gets hit by something? My whole body just jerked up, and I'm like, oh, my word, what is this? Okay. And I read this whole article, no Googles. Yes. There's no Google. You have to get onto the international telephone <laughs> and say, I'm looking for this kind of person overseas, you know. And they didn't refer to a specific organization or company, so I really had to search. But the word that captured my attention in the entire article was internal locus of control. Uh. And I'm like... If neurofeedback can teach this man an internal locus of control where I don't have to put out the external demarcation lines for him anymore, then this is what I want for him. Looked in South Africa, there was nobody here. Um, and then landed up with an amazing company. Their name is Eager, um, E-E-G-E-R. Um, booked, I, I, I actually... I spoke to a few people, they were the people that st kept on coming back to me and I thought, okay, I need to go with these. So I went over to Los Angeles and I got trained and I didn't even have a laptop at that stage. So I bought my first laptop there and they loaded all the equipment. I said, just put all the programs on there because I don't know. So when I got to South Africa, I've got a laptop. Fortunately, my brother-in-law at that stage is quite a boffin, you know, with computers. And now I have to do the whole time thing and know something has stuck, what's happening with the program. I think it took me about three months of chaos before I'm like, this is not so difficult. <laughs> this is just a computer. You know? um, so I got into the whole computer thing, started working on him. And what I did, again, in hindsight, I would do neurofeedback on him. My brother-in-law then got somebody to take him in to Pretoria to do the hyperbaric oxygen treatment. He would come back and I would put the electrodes on again and his brain would look different. And I'm like, okay, what else do you need to convince yourself that yeah. this is the right thing? So I did extensive neurofeedback with him, but all the other modalities as well, of which nutrition and wellness and supplementation was very important. Okay. And we just started developing, you know, and he he couldn't drive or anything, got onto a golf cart, he taught him how to drive again, and he's, he's good today. That's you know, what a miracle. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. It is a miracle. I'm very grateful for that. Um, so the, the one thing that I wanted to mention to you now, now is that often we think we need to go bottom down, say, for example, with memory. And what I learned with him that even if we repeated our names, he couldn't, because of that, that was our conversation we just had now. He couldn't, I couldn't lay that down into a long-term memory bank. So tomorrow morning, we will still be apple, apple, and apple. That's Afrikaans for apple. Um, and I, like, well, this is not working. I had this amazing dream, and I don't know if this is the right forum to use. It this. definitely okay. is the right forum. I yes. had this amazing dream one night, um, and I get lots of messages through dreams that I'm swimming in a huge aquarium. But it's like 
the, the water visibility is very poor. There's a lot of stuff floating around me and I can't see what's happening. And when I looked at the bottom, I saw little bags that looked like those little nugget bags when you go and you do you take your kids to the scratch patch and you pick up little gems. It looks like those little bags with a drawstring and a number on. But they're all over and they're empty and I'm like, who was so careless in my brain? You know, sometimes I tend to be OCD, so this needs to go into the right order. So I dive down, I put these little bags, I open them up. They were empty, obviously, at that stage because all the debris is drifting up around in the tank. And I put them in the right sequence. And as I put them in the right sequence, these things that are floating around start filtering and they they kind of sort themselves out and they go into number one, number two, number three, and I wake up and I'm like, what was that about? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to do with that information. And I'm sure people listening would have a whale of a time interpreting that dream. Um, but what I realized at that very specific moment the next day was that if I didn't structure his external environment in a very sequential manner, I could never get the internal environment to be sequenced. And if that internal environment isn't sequenced, I cannot update my working memory. And if I can't update my working memory, I cannot execute, I cannot follow instruction. I can repeat sentences to him, you know, it's not going to work. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do with this on a practical level? So what I did on a practical level, I said, okay, how do I create that, how do I, how do I reroute this man? He's, he's, he was unrooted, he was uprooted in this whole process. So my oldest daughter was about nine years old. And I said to her, okay, we're going to look at dad's life. You're going to find out for me where he was born, school, hospitals, how do, he comes from quite a chaotic background. Um, very interesting background though. Um, and that's what drew me to him. Um, let's, let's see what his life looked like. And I said, okay, let's plan over December holidays when he was a bit better because all his ribs broke and, you know, went into his lungs. So we had to wait a while before. It was about eight months after he came home that we did this. And we literally, for about four weeks to five weeks, I traveled through South Africa. I took him to Bloemfontein and said, okay, this is where you lived, where your parents lived before you were born. This is the hospital. This is Great College where you went to. So I kind of put his life in that way in sequence. And I get goosebumps now when I, when I talk about it. But once we started getting the sequence, what we also did, the little girls made big posters on our passage wall that put his, we got pictures of him from a baby that put it all into time frames. With the neurofeedback equipment, we have a program where we can put pictures in, into, onto the screen. So I took pictures and I started off. So when your brain waves, and we can talk about the neurofeedback now, when your brain goes into that ideal state where you're not making too much of the slow waves and too many of the of the um, high anxiety waves, the brain gets that spot and says, okay, this is where you need to be. So that's where optimal learning can start taking place. So on the screen in front of him, we had, it has blocks, that's how the program is developed. And I fed pictures into the software of the computer. So when he would look at the screen, as soon as he goes into that ideal state of concentration, uh, the, there would be a picture that opens up. And I try to put those pictures in as chronological sequence as possible so that we could actually, at, on that level, start developing that whole chronology of his life again, the, the development of his life again. And once we started looking at sequence in that way, once I started putting down those little bags from one to ten, um, the, 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 the memory started coming back. You know, so once we started the sequence and that external structure and being very routine based in, this is the time you wake up, this is the time. The whole circadian rhythm thing, okay, which is very important. Um, once we started that, the learning process started developing better. And that's only then when we started getting language back. So he had no language. You know, he was talking 
like baby language. And when language came back, he spoke English. In the hospital, actually, when he woke up for the first time, he spoke Sutu because the nursing staff was Sutu. So his, his language area was de uh, damaged. And the brain took on, how amazing is the brain? That the brain took on the language. It also, there's some research in World War II that happened with soldiers that were shot down and woke up in the hospital and spoke other language. That's where, when that happened, I'm like, okay, why is this happening? I saw that with my grandmother. She was brought up in a convent speaking Zulu, and she didn't speak Zulu her whole life, but just before she died, she only spoke Zulu. Yes. It was absolutely fascinating. But doesn't, you know, you've got this lifetime of training and formal training, and then you experience something like this, mm -hmm. doesn't it hit you with awe? Absolutely. How resilient and incredible the human yeah. brain is. And absolutely. we don't really understand and, it. And that's the hope of the message, is that the brain has neuroplasticity and, and the body can heal itself. There's, if we create the, the right kind of environment, we can achieve a lot with that brain. I absolutely believe that none of us are going to reach our ceilings. And I'm not talking about peak performance here. I'm talking about a broken brain. I'm talking about a brain that's got T, that's had TBI that we need to look at. So if somebody says to me, this is him, put him in a wheel wheelchair, I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work in my book. I think it's part of my personality that I question when people, I, I was the worst child for my mother because if she said no, I would say, why not? You know, and I'm still like that. Yes. Um, so I agree with you. Yes. You know, there's such resilience and... Um, of the human psyche and the human body there's such resilience we just need to guide these children to really achieve what they can achieve mm -hmm. let's go back to TBI briefly it's a it's a personal curiosity of mine I, I was a competitive rider when I was a child I had four concussions <sighs> knockout concussions mm -hmm. nobody knew what to do mm -hmm. they just said stay in bed as long as you're not throwing up it's Absolutely, fine yeah and chunks of my childhood have been erased from my oh. memory. And what do you do with that nowadays? How do you know if your child has hit their head hard enough to warrant concern? I think one should always be concerned um, when the child hit. You know, let me explain to you as well. We get a lot of these kids that come in and I do a very in-depth background assessment. And parents will say, yes, he fell off the jungle gym, but we did take him to hospital. And none of them will ever say, if it was a concussion, nobody would say, this is serious, we need to look at this. It's like with you falling off the horse, go and get into the bed, in bed, and you're going to be fine. Um, there's a psychiatrist overseas, Dr. Daniel Amen. I don't yes, know if I you do. know his work. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of his yes. because he does neurofeedback as well. He does the spec scanning, and he actually does a TED Talk where he says the most undiagnosed um, uh, thing that we see in the brain is post-concussion. So a lot of the children that come into the practice, adults, I had an adult guy the other day, an engineer from a mining, and I said to him, I can see you've had a severe concussion here. There's, I can still see the residue of that bruising. And he's like, no, I've never had a concussion. He kind of kept on saying no. Then a week later he phoned me, I said, I spoke to my mom, oh. and my mom told me that I was out for a day. But what did they do? They said, okay, no, just let him rest. And in terms of his mood regulation, this had a significant impact on his life, you know. So the, the CEO of the company just said, you know, when he gets when he gets wild in a meeting, we are scared of him, you know. He just gets out of control and he's very unreasonable. We started working with him. I just chatted to the CEO the other day and he just said, he's a different man. He says, you can't believe. And a key component that we can talk about is sleep because that's something that people underestimate. So when you work with TBI, um, and you don't necessarily have to have the brain scan that show that there's something happened to your brain. You, know, you can have a concussion and not pick it up. And that could still be a form of mild TBI concussion um, if you if you once you've been concussed or once like what my ex landed up in a coma it's like that that whole little mechanism that has to deal with your 24-hour cycle kind of goes sure. okay 
And I think that in the treatment of TBI, that must be one of the main things that we need to look at. I was asked by somebody to go down to Durban. Her son had an um, a, a accident and he was in a coma at home and um, there was a night nurse there. And the very first night I spent, I, I then spent time there because I was going to do neuro, I did neurofeedback with him was I said to her, I, I see that you wake up every three hours. She says, yes, I have to turn him. I said, so if we could just shift that to four hours, do you think it's going to have an impact? And she said, no, let's try it. So what we did is we kind of bought into the whole Australian rhythm thing. So when a baby is born, the baby's brain is in a four-hourly cycle. So you breastfeed every four hours and you get your anchor times. So we literally said to his brain, okay, four hours, we're going on to four hours, ultradian rhythm. But then I had to get to the point we would say, this is an awake state, so then open up all the windows so that the brain can get the light, even put the light on to know this is daytime. When the sun starts going down, we dim the lights. This is, even though he was in a coma, we had to get that whole, um, that whole circadian rhythm going again. As soon as there's been a concussion or a dysregulated brain, and this is one of the biggest lessons so far that I've learned with the, with the QEG database. BRC has a fantastic sleep questionnaire. I don't think that there's one child that has previously been diagnosed with ADD or an adult that's been diagnosed that when they fill in that sleep questionnaire will tell me that they have absolute 100% sleep. Absolutely. So if you don't imagine, if you can't reset the 24-hour cycle of the brain. I now want to go and reset 15 hertz as a cycle where you need to concentrate. I need to reset that in the brain. Not going to happen. Mm. Then I'm working top down and I'm not working bottom up. Mm. You know, my lymphatic system that has to take out all the toxins of all the environmental stuff or stuff that I'm putting in my mouth, my brain is not doing the vacuum cleaning at that time of, of the night. One of my biggest awarenesses is that, apart from the food stuff, uh, um, is the fact that we will, and the doctors that we work with, that's our main aim. I always say to parents, when the child starts sleeping, then you know we're going to solve the problem. And that's our first aim. And it's easy, because when you start talking, most of the parents will say, no, but they're okay. You know, when you say, but they fill in the questionnaire that indicates that there's some sleep dysregulation. And then I say, well, let's just monitor it. Let's take a nice little app, Sonic Sleep, or, you know, put on the Fitbit. Just see what, what or the Aura Ring, just put, let's just monitor some of the sleep here. And then they're like, oh, my word. Yeah. Percentage of deep sleep, very poor. Hardly going into a REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And then when we start um, introducing the right foods and we start um, introducing the right supplementation, those children start sleeping and that's the first layer almost that we need to look at is sleep and in TBI and concussion if you do not reset that 24-hour cycle um, you're not going to get you, you're going to get success but it's going to take you 90 sessions of neurofeedback instead of 20 sessions of neurofeedback so if you get that blood flow and that's what Daniel Amen does in his lab they measure blood flow and glucose metabolism mm -hmm. and the pictures that he gets on on the spec scan correlates very much with what we see on the qeg so in qegs the quantitative egs we have phenotypes yeah. and they're very specific phenotypes and when you look at what he finds there's a very good correlation a strong correlation between his his he calls it subtypes of add and subtypes of depression we have phenotypes in QEG. There's a very strong correlation. Sure. Yeah. So if we go back a step and, you know, over the past 15 years or so, every second child seems to be diagnosed with ADD, ADHD. Um, what are you seeing in the last, say, 20 years that you've been involved here? Is there an escalation? Is it simply it was always there but not diagnosed? And I think what all of those do? things, sorry, mm -hmm. I interrupted you. Yeah. I think... I think in terms of diagnosis, more things can be diagnosed these days. Um, I just have a big question mark 
around the whole DSM-5 approach where you know where you get a few symptoms you can have you can fill in you know the kind of questionnaire for me and it can look like you have inattentive ADD if you're not sleeping you're going to be inattentive sure. if you have there's a phenotype that we have in QEGs um, it's a low voltage brain a low amplitude brain and the analogy that I use for that brain is I'm trying to run my brain off used ever ready batteries, sorry, ever ready, and not <laughs> um, fresh Duracell batteries. It's like I'm trying to think and the energy isn't there. So in post TBI, we get quite low amplitude brain. The research that's out there now, and obviously we need more research, says that if you're dealing with that low amplitude brain, you have to look at that system metabolically. Um, to get that energy levels up. What was our point here? The thing is, I think what I'm trying to get at is how does a parent deal with this? Do they go on Oh, yes, we were talking about the diagnosis. Yeah. So if it's low amplitude brain, it's going to look very spacey and inattentive, and you'll say, well, that's definitely inattentive ADD. But there are also phenotypes for ADD. Um, so... I'm hesitant just to put a tag around because we, once you put a tag around it, and I'm not saying one shouldn't do it, you know, if I say to you, I've eventually found out that I've got Lyme disease and I know how to target it, that's a huge relief for me. I know where I'm going with that. So I'm not saying don't put tags, but be very careful, be very discriminatory in terms of how did you investigate to put that tag on. There's a young, um, I don't know if she's that young anymore, neurophysiologist in India. She actually does a TED talk on quantitative EGs. Um, I think she studied at Harvard, went to India, does QEGs in the lab. And in her, I think it's Adita Shank, it may be short for her longer names, um, where she says, why is it that the people that are dealing with brain-based pathology dysregulation using symptoms and not looking at the brain itself so it's about accuracy of diagnosis um thomas insel who until recently was the head of nhi in in the states just before he um i think he resigned um and I apologize if I've got the information not correct here, but he basically said that when we're looking at diagnosis, we have to we have to really look at the DSM-5 and perhaps bring in more brain-based assessments. Okay. So Thomas Ensel said that when they publish a DSM-5 again, which is our diagnostic statistical manual, uh, which is not statistical at all, by the way, but that's a whole other conversation to be had. Um, one, when one deals with brain dysregulation, at least have some form of measure to know that this is what you're talking about. And I think there's definitely a shift. I think it's going to take a long time. It's not going to happen in my lifetime in South Africa in terms of accepting QEGs that are research, it's statistical, it's reliable to accept it as a mainstream tool. So if I were to make an appointment and come in for a QEEG because I can't concentrate or I've got gaps in my memory or for whatever reason, or if my child has been, been diagnosed as ADHD at school, what would happen? What would the process involve? Okay, so um, obviously we have to be registered as EEG technicians to be able to administer the EEG, first of all. And I do work under the supervision of a neurophysiologist in South Africa. His name is Piet van Mark. Um, what we basically do is we have a cap um, that we put on. The cap is a little bit more precise in terms of exactly where the electrodes are going. We are a research lab, so we have to be very, very strict with how I, um, how we administer the QEG. Um, that cap then has electrodes embedded that goes obviously to the very specific areas of the brain that we normally look at when we look, uh, do an EEG. So there we're measuring electrical activity on the outer layer of the cortex. Um, and that's where we get the reading of the frequencies from delta, theta, alpha, beta, and looking at those domains to see where are the amplitudes, the height of the wave, not quite where it should be for age and gender. But what we also do, and this is what makes the BRC database so amazing, is they have also included an autonomic nervous system assessment. So we put on electrodes where we're literally measuring 
skin conductance, we're measuring heart rate, we're measuring um, muscle tension. So we, we're actually getting that measure from the autonomic nervous system in terms of that balance between fight and flight and rest and digest. So this is where obviously the Stephen Porcher stuff comes in with his polyvagal theory. And there you get different types of measures, heart rate, high frequency, heart rate, low frequency, heart rate, very low frequency, of which all of them has a different meaning when we start looking at the autonomic nervous system. And you put it all together gives you a different picture. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then you correlate that with what's coming up in the bloods. You know, if you've got that kind of low heart rate frequency, do I always get low cortisol levels? You know, too low cortisol levels, for example. You know, I don't have the research, but that's definitely a trend that's coming out. I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician. I have to do the job. Um, and the, so we measure the autonomic nervous system. And what's so important is that that's a whole system, it's a whole person. So I could have a brain that looks very over aroused, excited, very hyper, very um, hyperactive ADD type of thing, but does the body match that? Or I could have a brain that has very low level of arousal, and that's the, the, the terminology that we use in neurology and in um, neurofeedback, a brain like a blue brain that's got really low amplitude. And what we see then is that the body, in terms of the autonomic nervous system, almost tries to compensate for that very low energy levels. So it's pumping adrenaline, pumping adrenaline in a very inappropriate manner. So that's why that's such a good measure for me to have. And obviously there we're going down into the brain stem stuff. So can we do talk therapy for that kind of anxiety that we're picking up? Not gonna work. Um, what we also do, which for me, and I've just mentioned it before, which for me from, an, from a, a teacher educational point of view has made a lot of sense, is doing ERPs. ERPs are the event-related potentials. Um, so we do that, we put little headphones on, once we've done the eyes open and eyes closed EEG with the child, put the headphone on and then give that auditory artful task. So it's a stimulus, beep, 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 every time they hear the high tone, sorry, the high beep didn't come through, um, then they've got little buttons in front of them where they have to press the button. So that's where I say to you, where we're literally measuring, so where we're literally measuring What's happening in the brain in terms of at 100 milliseconds, 200, 300, 400? And obviously 100, that trigger, that realization at a subconscious level of what's, what's happening. You know, this, I'm going to get a sound through. And um, we get quite a few of the children that's landed up in speech therapy that will have a central auditory processing disorder that says I'm not processing the language but if you then go further you know you kind of reverse back and say so what happened at 100 milliseconds was I actually attending at that moment when the information was coming through or was I over attending was I over alert we can also measure target and background information because we do target and background assessment so your traumatized people that that have the ears out there scanning the environment. So your ears can hear further than what your eyes can see. So obviously that becomes one of your survival techniques is to keep your ears out there. So if you have a child that's constantly in a fight and flight mode, when the teacher then speaks to him, he's not just gonna listen to her voice. If anything else happens, the brain says, I don't know how to discern between target and background, what is essential or not essential. And therefore they then land up with that initial sensory processing thing of not being able to filter out what is essential or not essential. So if I'm not processing language properly then, where does this problem come from? So that the ERP really gives us a nice indication of where to step back to. And often it's back to the vagus nerve. And if you go and look at the work again of Stephen Porches, he's got an um, auditory technique that he's, that he's developed the same as that Dr. Tumati has developed many, many years ago. He's really the pioneer in this field where you teach the brain and the frequent and the ears to actually hear what it's supposed to be hearing and the direction where is it coming from be alert to certain frequencies but not so alert to other frequencies the distraction yes does this um hinge into autism or not? well the autistic spectrum kids do have sensory 
difficulty. So they can easily become overloaded by information and then they block their ears. You know, if they have a helicopter going over, they need to block their ears because that sound is here. It's in their brain. Um, so you can get auditory sensitivities, not just necessarily in the autistic mm -hmm. spectrum, like everything. You sure. know, you can have a little bit of something but not be in a spectrum. Um, but definitely your autistic spectrum kids do have sensory sensitivities. Yes. And to say that X is happening or Y is happening in the brain with an autistic person is, is an oversimplification as well. But we're seeing so much more of this or is it again a case that we couldn't diagnose it the same way a couple of years ago? I don't think we could, could have diagnosed it in the same way many years ago. I also think that our lives have become more complex. You know, if you look at the environment, and I know we're busy talking about what happens in the lab, but if we look at our environment, if we look at um, pollution, and if we look at the foods that we're eating, you know, if we when we test these bloods, you know, you see that, the amount of pathogens and heavy metals that we get in these children's bodies. And that's the kind of kids that fall into that MTHFR gene mutation where they're just not getting rid of toxins, you know. So there's such a buildup of toxins there that the brain just says, okay, I don't know how to deal with it. And then they don't sleep and then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come out of the body. Um, so I think we know more. I definitely think we know more, but I also think that if we look at our environment and we're not into the soil with lovely organic stuff, I think it has a detrimental impact in the, on the development of our children. And then we go and say, well, just give them a tablet and they're going to get better instead of going back and saying, what's the source? You know, Dr. Mark Hyman is on quite a high horse at the moment in terms of what's happening in the environment. You know, how are we producing food? Why do we? Why do our bodies look the way we do? And he's also got his own personal journey in terms of his health. You know that that land. We need to look at that. We need to sit up and take note of that. And I think that's why it's more prevalent. Has anyone really done any research into what happens in a juvenile brain when they're exposed to social to to devices, to iPads for hours on end? There's definitely research out there. You know, if you've got a sensitive brain already, so those are the kids that are so reactive to the environment. We get certain patterns again on a QEG. But if I'm working with a sensitive brain, my assumption must already be how sensitive am I going to be to the light frequencies that are coming up? What kind of light bulbs am I using in my house? How sensitive am I I'm going to be to the blue light exposure that I'm getting from my devices or just the electromagnetic fields from the devices? So there are children where if you start putting the right things into place, you know, putting grounding mats down, making sure that you've got a copper wire perhaps around their bed to take the ESCOM power lines contamination away. You go out of your way and you do the EEG again, the EEG is different. Yes. And those children that are so sensitive, those are the ones where the brains look like there's a neurological storm. I worked with a child where the dad was desperate. He took a home system in neurofeedback. And he's just saying, I'm not getting any results. What's wrong with the system? There's a lot of artifact. I said, listen, I'm going to get in my car. I live here in Randburg then, and he's on in Kempton Park on the other side. So guess what's very close to his house? There's some power stations are there. So I stopped my car, and not 50 meters away is an Eskom power line. I say to him, I don't even have to look at this. Do you know that this has an impact on your child? So what was happening with that child is every morning when he woke up, he had blood on his pillow. So he was having little seizures. And even though they did an EEG, they didn't pick up the seizure because sometimes, uh, uh, you know, in sleep, that's where things happen. Mm. But once they moved away, that dad immediately bought another house. He just said, really? I can't live here anymore. Sure. Bought another house. That child was in a remedial school at that time. Moved away, did neurofeedback, and that child finished off his schooling career in a mm. mainstream school. So in terms of electrical interference or wave interference, whether it's waves from the air, you know, from sound, from the light, from our devices, we are electrical beings. And we can't think, we, you can't even think that it doesn't have an impact. We if you think that, then you, don't, that then you don't understand sure. quantum physics. Sure. Then go back into Noah's Ark. You know, where are you? This is the 21st century. Sure. Look, yeah. I mean, if we contain as much water as we are supposed to, we are conductors of electricity. Absolutely. And it's going to go through us and influence every Absolutely. electromagnetic frequency, specifically the brain. Yes. 
So how do we protect ourselves? We are inundated. Out comes 5G, Wi-Fi, bulbs that aren't, uh, that don't replicate sunrise and sunset. Yes. We could live in a Faraday cage. Yes. Um, we could go off to the Kruger Park, hopefully occasionally. No, I think that's the solution, just that's, go and live in the bush. Yes. <laughs> And everyone wonders why they sleep so well in the bush. It's yeah. because there's no stimulus. Yes, and absolutely. you do regenerate out in the in the wilderness. Yes. I think if you know that that your child is definitely sensitive to that. And I, I you know, if you if you don't know, assume that there is a sensitivity. Rather err at you know, on that side. Um, make sure that you switch your Wi Fi off at night. You know, don't have, I mean, I chatted to parents the other day. The Wi-Fi is, I said, where's your, where's your router? Um, no, the router's in the study. Where's the study? Oh, right next to his room. Oh, um, and how high is the table to the child's bed? Oh, no, it's exactly the same height. You know, so this child keeps on having these huge nightmares and things like that. We're trying everything in terms of food and supplementation. In the meantime, the Wi-Fi has a significant impact. Switch it off at night, better. Practical tips, you know, and if you look at the, the sleep people when they or keep the room dark, put off all electrical devices. Not even one little red light should be shining. And if there's such a sensitivity, speak to the people that know that if you're wearing a pendant that can block off, uh, which we get you know, from our health shops, that can block off that interference, then at least you know you're walking around with a Faraday mm. cage around you. Yes, you know. And it's not woo-woo. This is actual, no, this is real. Woo-woo. There's too much research. You know, and if you look at... Ca- countries now where they are at least starting with research on the impact of 5G. Mm. Uh, you yeah. know, we don't always have to wait. I, I mean, if I had to wait for research on hyperbaric oxygen treatment, we would still be in a wheel- wheelchair at this stage, you know. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. Also, don't be, um, you know, you get people that are all gloom and doom and, and like the worst possible thing is going to happen. I think it's about a balance. Yes, yeah, somewhere in the middle. You have to have a balance about these things, but take note, you know, especially if you know you're running into trouble with your child and you've tried a lot of things, there's a possibility that that child will have an electromagnetic frequency sensitivity. And it's so really easy to, to test, yes. just turn the plug off. Or if yes. you can't get a plug time and get yes. it to turn it off at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. for no. you, so you don't even have to remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you touched on something that's very important if you look at sunlight, you know. Do get out in the sun in the early morning. You know, um, my question is still, there's a, um, a, a doctor overseas that talks a lot about the sunlight. He's quite, he's quite controversial, he's straightforward. He, don't, don't, he doesn't mince his words, but he says that um, light, the, the angle of the light in the morning is really important. And one of my colleagues overseas, Lynn Lennon, said to him, I would like to know how do you test the angle and why does that angle of sunlight in the morning has that specific influence on the brain? still don't have the answer if, when I get that out it, you know. So. It may have to do with the angle and the light intensity. So yes. there's a specific yes. light intensity that hits your yes. retina Absolutely. at a certain time of day. Yeah. So flooding your room with sunlight, if you happen to be lucky enough to have an east-facing window, is the best way to wake up. Absolutely. Um, I, what I do with a couple of patients is if they're battling with sleep and don't want to go down the sleeping uh, pool route, which that's a whole other story yeah, yeah. because it, it creates a false sense of sleep. And also you don't go all through all your sleep phases. Yes, yeah. and you can measure that yourself with your, mm-hmm. with your device, is, is to go to bed with a sunset. And mm-hmm. most people resist this because mm-hmm. they don't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. But the amount of people who've said, well, I just fell asleep and I woke yeah. up 12 hours later and I feel yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's, it's your innate wisdom. It's, it knows what to do with that. Yeah. It's utterly fascinating. Yeah. If you give the brain and the body a chance and the tools, yeah. it will fix itself. Mm. So just to start winding up, what are some very basic, simple tips that anybody could do if they are battling to concentrate themselves, are anxious, have children who can't concentrate at school? We've spoken about um, protecting ourselves from electromagnetic stimulation. How much time should children be on a device, for example? I don't think, yeah, I don't think that there's pure research out there in terms of saying, I think there are people that are estimating the time. But I don't think it's necessary for children to have access during the week at all. Um, if you tell me that, I'm going to go, no, 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 I need to do my research. I have to, you know, I'm, I, but I use 
you know, a blue filter blocker on my glasses. You know, I bought some of Dave Asprey's um, glasses and I'm, you know, I make sure that I don't get that com contamination. But children basically don't need to be on their devices um, during the week unless they really have to make, you know, do some research. I'm horrified that there are schools and universities that says we're going to teach through iPads. You know, they, I'm like, what, where's the tactile information that I'm getting from this page when I'm touching this page? And we have to be in the, in the 21st century, but we also need to know how to limit that. So I, I would say if parents could not to have the devices available, um, what happens these days because of our level of anxiety in our society, we become extremely over-focused. It's a process that happens from the limbic system, from the, from the brain stem and, and the brain. And when we become over-focused, we get into these little rituals of, I need to go onto my device. I mean, it's habit-forming, habit-forming, habit-forming. And we also have the habits, because within our habits and our rituals, we become very safe. You know, that's our own form of safety that we create for ourselves. So we have to be very careful that that's not just another tablet. The tablet is becoming another medication exactly. to help us deal with that. So, you know, outside time and play time and time with your younger children just on a floor, you know, that's really what we need to look at, you know, um, and spending quality time. I did a fantastic therapy um, training called DIR, where we are taught to be absolutely in the moment with a child on the carpet, an autistic child that can't react to you. How do you make yourself totally available? And if we are on our devices all the time, to create that safe space for, your, for our children, we, we're so in zombie mode with everything else that we don't have that connectivity. You know, we were just referring to happiness. So what Stephen Porcher says, that it, do I live in this reactive body, reactive brain all the time? Because if I'm there, I can't connect socially. And ultimately, I'm a social being. Ultimately, my connection with other people and, and that feedback that I'm getting from other people is what makes me a person. And if you are in zombie mode all the time, that becomes very limited in terms of time. So it's going to impede on our happiness. Yeah, well, the quality of our lives is Absolutely. determined by the quality of our connections. Yes. Our yeah. social attachment is yeah. so important. Yeah, and I think perhaps that is the first message, is, is throw away the distractions, play a board game, go for a walk and reconnect with your children and yourself and your eye spouse. Eye contact, eye contact, yeah. have that contact with each other. And I think even if you just look at that as a reason and not even look at the electromagnetic frequencies and everything else, if that's not a good enough reason for you to really rethink where your child is going with a device, then you didn't get a message here. You know, what I've picked up from what you've said is we look, we're discussing children who are dissociated from being able to hook in and understand and connect. But as a parent, what am I, where am I doing mm. this? Where am I demonstrating Absolutely. this behavior? Yeah. Where can't I concentrate mm. or connect or make eye contact? Mm. It all starts, it's, it's, mm. there's nothing in isolation here. And there's nothing in isolation. And I think parents are burdened these Very days. Very much. You know, um, and it, you know, we can't go and tell them, you must do this and must do this. And I think that just places a, a bigger load on parents, you know, and one has to be very careful to do that. But just go right down to the humane things of what are we supposed to, to be like as, as people? We, we're supposed to connect that. And that's why Stephen Porch's theory is ultimately a social attachment theory. Yeah, love it. This has been possibly one of the most wonderful discussions I've had in a long time. I look forward to more. We've got so much else to talk about, so there is more coming. Watch this space. And I'd like to thank you so, so much for making your time available. It has been the most wonderful hour, and it has <laughs> flown past. So, yes, thank you so much. And I'm going to put all of your contact details onto the, the social media pages and the website so that anybody listening can contact you. And if you can just give me a list of the books you mentioned as well, anybody that you can think of, whether it be um, authors or TED Talks that you think will benefit people who are going down this road, please, by all means, the more information we can get out there, the better chance we've all got at getting this right. It's been such a pleasure. 
Thank you. This episode has been sponsored by Jackson's Whole Food Market. If you would like to win a hamper full of delicious, healthy products, please go to the link in the show notes, which can be found at reinventhealth.co.za forward slash podcast notes. Include your name and loyalty card number and stand a chance to win.